Okay, life can be crazy. You're feeling like you're sinking. Just trying to find a meaning. It's time for better thinking. Yeah, better thinking. Time to tune in. Let's go. Welcome back to Better Thinking. My name's Nesh Nikolic, and my guest today is Professor Nick Haslam. He is a professor of psychology at the University of Melbourne. He received his honours from the University of Melbourne, his master's and PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, and taught at the New School for Social Research in New York before returning to Australia in 2002. Nick's research interests are in personality, social, and clinical psychology, and he has published 11 books and about 300 articles or book chapters in these related areas. In addition to his academic writing, Nick contributes regularly to The Conversation, Inside Story, and Australian Book Review, and he has also written for Time, The Monthly, The Guardian, The Washington Post, The Australian, and two best Australian science writing anthologies. Nick is a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia, the Society for Personality and Social Psychology, and the Association for Psychological Science. At his university, Nick is a leader in the Social Psychology Group and co-director of the Mental Health PhD program. In the past, he has been head of the School of Psychological Sciences, pro-vice-chancellor, a member of the ARC College of Experts and president of the Society of Australasian Social Psychologists. The topic today is called concept creep, a term that Nick coined some time ago and I think is incredibly fascinating, particularly if you are a psychologist or counsellor or therapist practising as I think its implications are immense in clinical work. Enjoy. Nick, a very big thank you for coming onto the podcast today. You're most welcome. I'm looking forward to it. Look, I, I, I have to admit that I am quite excited to, to talk to you today because I've been reading um, the absolutely fantastic book, The Coddling of the American Mind. Uh, which is written by Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt, who I think have done a, a marvellous job. I have to confess I haven't got through the whole book yet, but you were referenced multiple times in in, in that book about this concept of uh, uh, concept creep, and I thought I would reach out, pick your brain, so thank you for, for your generosity of coming on. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about about this book, I suppose, but but more so this concept and and like what I like to do often is find out how does someone find themselves falling into this space, you know, from a, from a personal front. How did you, uh, uh, you know, find yourself looking at concept creep? And I'll obviously find out much more about that, but um, maybe a little bit of a backstory would be nice as a starting point. For sure. Look, so I'm a rather old academic at this point. I, at one point I was a young man with promise, but now I'm 60 years old. So I've been doing this for a long time and I've had academic jobs since 1992, I think it is. Uh, and when you've been around that long, I think you notice the history of the field. You notice that ideas are changing, you know, that uh, words seem to be shifting their meanings, that intellectual fashions and fads come and go. Uh, and so I think what happened with me in terms of concept creep, which I'm sure we'll go into in more detail, was that I was just noticing uh, about eight years ago uh, when I wrote the paper that some of the words we were using in this space, um, partly in clinical psychology, but also in developmental and social and personality, seem to be just broadening their meanings over time and that um, language wasn't standing still. And you sort of know abstractly that language isn't standing still. You know that concepts are always evolving and our understandings of the world are always evolving. But if you're new to a field, you don't know its history. And I think I've always been interested in history and um, I was just observing that some ideas seem to be changing. Uh, and so my work came out of that, essentially. I know it's a bit of a non-answer, but um, I know we'll go into more details um, later. But I think concept creep as an idea was just my reflection on some broad trends that seem to be going on, both in psychology and in the culture more generally. And, and you're right, Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff in that terrific book, which I also reviewed a few years ago for um, a local magazine called Inside Story, 
uh, make use of this idea of concept creep. And there's a better, also an interesting backstory, if you don't mind me rabbiting on here, Nesh. Please. Uh, Jonathan Hyde actually is someone who I went to grad school with. So um, he and I shared an office for many years. He became very famous. Um, me, not quite so much. But uh, we were both in graduate school in psychology at the University of Pennsylvania in the late 80s, early 90s. So I've sort of been following his career for a very long time and um, sort of know and respect what he's done a very great deal. Look, I think as a, as a psychologist, this, this space around words broadening their meaning is so important because I, I at least personally feel that therapy is so much about the language that we use and, and certainly psychology is the way that we think is integral to our well-being and and to try and have a grasp or an understanding or if i can call it an awareness about language whether it's from a relational frame theory in the in the act model or or just in general as a human being there is such importance of considering our words and i know that you know, terms like trauma, which I've had uh, uh, fairly strong thoughts about in the past, were raised in, in in this book, and it certainly resonated for me in terms of how the word trauma has evolved or moved. My apologies from a medical understanding, uh, like a you know TBI, traumatic brain injury, through to uh, these days, it's used a lot more loosely to describe a series of unwanted thoughts, a series of unwanted experiences, a series of unwanted memories. Uh, and so trauma is being thrown around quite, quite, uh, uh, I suppose, loosely. And, and that's even occurring in the clinical field as well. I, I certainly hear my, my colleagues um, and even occasionally kind of a bit afraid, afraid of the word trauma. It's, it, it, it's become kind of a bigger um bigger term to hold. Yeah, and look, you're just describing a paradigm case of concept creep. Uh, in fact, trauma was one of the concepts that I use as an illustration of this phenomenon back in the 2016 paper where I coined this term. Um, you, what you're describing, I think, is um, something that a few of us feel, uh, which is this word is broadening um, sometimes to the point of um, uh, uselessness. Uh, again, that's a bit of a strong claim, perhaps, and maybe I'll back off that slightly. But it, once, it, as you say, um, if you go historically back, it was once referring exclusively to physical injuries or wounds. So even if you go back to DSM-1, the first edition, you know, back in the uh, 1950s, the word trauma only appears in the sense of a physical injury. So if, if you had a brain injury due to electricity or poisoning or a bonk on the head, um, that was what trauma meant then. And um, since early in the uh, 20th century, there was this broadening to include psychological wounds and injuries. And that's fine. Language does that, right? There is some metaphorical similarity between a um, psychological wound and a physical wound. Um, the language is broadening to include that. But then, as you say further, as you go through successive editions of the DSM and also in general culture, people are using this word to refer to milder, less severe, more ordinary sorts of experiences. Um, and that is, again, uh, a, a concept creep. Basically, I, I don't want to jump ahead too far, but what I say in regard to concept creep is that a whole lot of concepts having to do with harm, of which trauma is one great example, have broadened. And they've broadened in two directions. So I talk about what um, horizontal uh, concept creep, which is the tendency for words to broaden to encompass qualitatively different phenomena, like when trauma moves from being just about physical uh, injury to psychological injury, and also what I call vertical creep, where a concept broadens to include milder, less severe phenomena, as when trauma or traumatic events in particular um, used to be restricted to those which were sort of life-threatening and outside the range of human ordinary experience and uh, become just simply uh, unpleasant experiences or witnessed experiences or vicarious experiences. Um, and there are two different directions in which this meaning, this word has, has acquired a much wider range of meanings, which leads it to be used a whole lot more frequently. So again, uh, I'm, I'm going on at length, but trauma is just simply one great example of a word that now means a whole lot more than it used to. Hmm. 
And and how does concept creep evolve? How how does it occur? I know that these days, yeah, we quite regularly hear people say, "Oh, you know, I've had such a a, a terrible day. I feel depressed. You know, or um, I, I'm feeling anxious." And and they, they, you know, depression, anxiety in today's language is is just so often used. And and you know, certainly when I was growing up, that language just wasn't even about. It was very much a clinical term that I, I don't recall having that conversation with friends or even hearing it amongst other students. Uh, and now it, it's it's a very commonly used term, at least here in Australia, and I'm, I'm, I'm assuming likewise in many other countries. How does concept creep occur? You know, what are some of the forcing functions? Um, you know, is, is there... Uh, an understanding about uh, how the, the, these broadening meanings kind of occur through culture? It's an extremely difficult question because probably there are many different dynamics going on uh, all at once. I think all I'd say uh, is when I called it concept creep, uh, I was referring to it being a gradual process. So it doesn't happen all at once. We don't all of a sudden decide, okay, from now on, trauma is going to refer to a much wider range of phenomena than it used to. It's a gradual process of expansion. Uh, and I think it goes along with just words being used more freely. So when words get used more extensively, they tend to acquire uh, wider meaning. So as words just popularize, they get used in more and more context. Uh, so part of it is just words become popular. Now, why do those words become popular? Well, partly it's the success of psychology and psychiatry and the general increase in discourse about mental health and illness that's taken place over the last you know few decades so you know partly it's a sign that the populace is just more aware of suffering and mental illness and uses this psychiatric lexicon to describe their experience when previously they wouldn't so it's sort of in some part uh, due to the success of the sort of stuff that we do as a field um, even if it's now the case that these words are being used a bit promiscuously sometimes. But it's not just about mental health as well. So we use the example of trauma mm. here. But my point about concept creep is it's not just about mental illness or trauma uh, or psychiatric kinds of suffering. It's also about other kinds of harm. So you can tell exactly the same story about different kinds of interpersonal harm. You can talk about bullying. The concept of bullying has also broadened massively um, from the 1970s. So if you'll let me just continue to, to give my rant, when bullying was introduced into the psychological literature by this uh, Norwegian psychologist, um, Dan Olweus, back in the 1970s, he was really particular about how he defined it. He said bullying is peer aggression among kids, uh, which is repetitive, intentional, and perpetrated downwards in a status hierarchy. So bigger or older or um, a larger number of kids bullying smaller, younger, more vulnerable kids. And over time, scholars in the work in the field of bullying have just been gradually uh, stretching that further and further. So it's not required that the behavior is intentional anymore. It's not required that the behavior is repetitive anymore. You can now uh, bully people, not just downwards in a hierarchy, but upwards. You can bully your bosses. You can bully your co-workers. It's now talked about at least as much in terms of adult workplaces as it is in schools and kids. Uh, there's, of course, new kinds of bullying enabled by new technologies like cyberbullying. So it's not just physically standing over someone and beating them up. It's also spreading vicious rumors about them. And I'm not trivial. I'm not saying that they, these kinds of misbehavior are, are trivial, but I'm just saying the word is now being used much, much more broadly. And that's not about mental illness. That's just about a form of bad behavior. And you can tell the same story about violence. You know, words are now violence in some circumstances, not just physical um, hostility. Uh, you can tell the same story about prejudice, how different sorts of attitudes are now counted as being prejudiced than they were before. There's a whole range of concepts to do with harm, which I thought have undergone the same kind of broadening. Now, you questioned about what's driving that. I mean, it's really hard, I think, to narrow it down. Partly, I think it's because, um, you know, some of these disciplines like psychology and psychiatry have just increased their um their influence within the culture and so we're just using these terms more partly i think it's because in some respects um there is less hardship in our lives than there was a century ago and we therefore become more sensitized to 
uh, less um, severe um, phenomena. You know, we, we, we call things traumatic when there aren't that many, um, you know, big T traumas out there in the world. Partly is that people deliberately, you know, expand uh, the definitions of concepts um, uh, for reasons that might be political or might just be uh, technical. So the DSM over its editions has consistently broadened what it counts as a mental illness over time. And that's a sort of institution that's that's uh, creeping a concept. It's saying this used to be just some sort of um, uh, undesirable behavior, but now it's a ratified kind of mental illness. So I think I'm giving you a very roundabout answer. I'm sorry, Nish, no, but there no. are so many contributors to this. And I think our morality as well, our general morality has become more focused on harm. Uh, you know, Jonathan Haidt um, has done a lot of work in this field of moral psychology. He's sort of one of the dominant figures of it. And he points out that morality hasn't always just been about harm um, and, and caring for people who are vulnerable. Uh, it also um, has been to do with uh, purity and ideas of sanctity. And those kinds of morality have just sort of declined, um, he would say, in most parts of the Western world. And this morality of harm has tended to increase. And if you're focusing on harm, then it goes without saying that you're going to be more alert to ways in which people are being harmed and you'd be more likely to identify things as being harmful than you would have previously. And part of what we say is going on with concept creep is just that the society, the culture, is becoming more vigilant about and concerned about harm. Nico, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether there is a contributor or, or a function around uh, people tiptoeing about correcting these this creep and and i say that because i have caught myself so many times in my podcasts because they they go to the public about being careful to put caveats in and and try and be be very very selective to to be considerate and similarly even when you and i are talking about these terms like bullying or um you know uh, domestic violence uh, uh th these are all terms that start to pull out but we almost have to go out and say i have to remind the audience i'm not trivializing this j j just because i'm focusing on a word i'm not saying it doesn't exist so when i when i do talk about trauma uh, and asking the question around creep i'm not saying that trauma in terms of people having extremely you know uh, uh, severe unwanted experiences I'm not going out and trivializing that or invalidating that, but it's almost like there's 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 this tippy toe nature that's going on that 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 says I've got to be careful about how I say this so that people don't get upset, you know. And and so if we go out and I don't know, let, let's just challenge the word of coercive control in a domestic violence space. Uh, there is definitely an understanding that control in domestic violence or in domestic spaces can be quite upsetting and it can be harmful and, and and so on there can actually be another side which is that control you know could be considered as leadership and and the you know and someone taking initiative obviously it's a nuanced conversation we're not talking about the very severe end where someone is striking another person with a fist everyone can observe that but there's a nuance that goes along with these conversations that makes us all a bit, I suppose, nervous in, in, in this space. I'm wondering whether that's what maybe uh, Greg and Jonathan are, are talking about in, in, in terms of when we're so heightened to the concept of harm and we're trying to reduce harm, we're a little bit careful about how we raise these words or, or, or allow these words to be so that we don't, you know, insult, upset, uh, uh, other people and maybe that's a bit of the forcing function of how these terms just continue to to be used because it's uh it's it's a moral thing to do it makes sense we do want to be kind to our fellow human um you know, from a loving and compassionate way what are your thoughts i think you're quite right you have to be very careful about these things uh, and i do think that um uh it is important not to feel that just because you're challenging certain uses of a word that you're therefore, you know, being heartless or, or not taking something seriously, I think it's quite possible to resist 
the spread or the creep of concepts and still take the issues um, seriously. If you're concerned about trivializing things, I mean, I think you can make the counter argument that if you're broadening a concept too far, you end up trivializing the phenomenon that way. We've actually done research on this. If you uh, give people expanded definitions about what bullying and trauma um, and prejudice and things like that are, they tend to um, see those things as being less important. So I think in anything, if anything, you can make an argument that uh, the trivialization is something that results from the concept creep. Um, so I think it's important to be sensitive to people and to be concerned about not invalidating their experience. But you've also got to challenge um, uh, where, you, where, where terms are being used inappropriately or excessively, or at least push back against them. Because again, in everything I'm talking about now, we're doing research on. It's not just uh, one guy pontificating here. There are huge individual differences in the breadth of people's concepts of harm. People simply don't agree on these things. We all use the same words, but we mean quite different things by them. What one person counts as racism, another person doesn't. What one person counts as trauma, another person doesn't. What is bullying, as you, I think, just said, isn't always clear. You know, from one standpoint, the behavior might be seen as uh, an unreasonable demand and an aggressive one, but from the person perpetrating the supposed bullying, it might just be a legitimate use of workplace authority. There's no clear right answer about these things. And I think uh, it's unfair to challenge people who are querying where the boundary gets placed here, because I think it's really important to have clarity and to try to seek some sort of agreement between people. But yeah, look, you know, when I do this work on concept creep, I'm always um, trying to be super careful. Uh, there's always people who I think go to see this sort of work as being intrinsically reactionary um, uh, when it honestly isn't. I go out of my way to point out that um, this concept creep is a mixed blessing, that on the one hand, it is good if you problematize bad behavior that we previously tolerated. Broadening some concepts of harm, calling out certain things as bullying, which we previously just thought were ordinary office politics, has a good side. It leads to um, behavior, bad behavior being seen as inappropriate. You've got a label for why it's inappropriate. You've got a target for something to reduce. That is good. But I'm also pointing out that in addition to those positive aspects, uh, there can also be some negative aspects. People can be overly fragile. They can be um, have sort of false positives where they identify things as being harmful and threatening when maybe they aren't really. Uh, and it can have all sorts of downstream uh, negative effects. And I think all I'm trying to do as an academic uh, is investigate what some of the costs and benefits of this concept creep are and document that it's happening because it's clearly happening. Mm -hmm. It's interesting the, the the concept of harm is is so broad. I know that even in the uh, the world of compensation that there is a, I don't know if it's a law, but there, there's, there's an understanding that the administrative side of compensation can't be considered as inducing harm so asking uh, someone who is part of a or was put in for example a compensation claim they believe they've been harmed in in the workplace for example they're asking them to go and attend an appointment uh, can't be considered as as a harm you know even if that appointment means that they need to go into state or they need to attend you know an appointment with a GP and that there's going to, going to be a rehabilitation provider with them that's present. Uh, some people find that as being you know harmful or they attribute it as, as being an act of aggression by the insurer as an example. But I believe in that case, uh, there is some sort of legal uh, uh, um, understanding that, that that doesn't constitute harm. You can't argue that or, or it certainly won't be held as as part of an argument when when a decision is being made uh, but harm in the regular world uh, is, is is it's become such a sensitive thing that that where um it feels like there's a sensitivity in, in in nature because of this creeping effect that that words are now or even conversations potentially this conversation can feel harmful for a a listener yeah, and it depends what you count as harm. As you say, it's very subjective. And I mean, you're in the therapy game uh, and you're dealing with word meanings and people's interpretations and certain interpretations of experience being counterproductive and unhelpful. I mean, I trained in cognitive therapy and I don't know anything about ACT, I'm sorry to say, but 
uh, you know, I, I'm coming from that background as well. How you interpret things makes a huge difference. If you interpret something as harmful, um, that leads to a range of emotional responses, behavioural responses, which might be quite self-defeating. So we don't need to take at face value people's definition of what counts as harmful. Um, we we recognise that people will see different things as harmful and see them as harmful to different extents. And I think part of what the Lukianov and Height book does is say that maybe um, in some American environments, and no doubt it's also going on in the rest of the world, people are perhaps setting the threshold for what counts as harm too low uh, in a way that uh, leads to what they call safetyism, uh, this uh, excessive, as they see it, uh, tendency to uh, seek safety from really ordinary slings and arrows of life. Uh, and that leads to um, some, I think, fairly undesirable uh, um, situations on American college campuses, uh, they would argue, and maybe in the culture at large, people being overly concerned about relatively minor threats. Well, I think that that concept of safetyism is, is certainly alive in Australia as well. I know that safe spaces are terms that are used particularly in schools for for young people. Um, you know, I, I know that we've even had a scenario here in, in in my clinic where a psychologist raised that one of their clients said that uh, uh, they didn't feel safe in our waiting room, um, which, you know, uh, should be understood and appreciated as the experience of the client. And I, I think that would, in my eyes at least, not knowing anything about that case, but it would highlight the potential need to explore in therapy, you know, what is it about a waiting room that makes it feel unsafe, you know, because the, the, unsafe is quite a concerning feeling. If I felt unsafe, I think my heart would start to race and, you know, I'd be on edge, I'd be in the hypervigilant state. Uh, I had an actual fact looking for the fight or flight. I'm I'm going to have, to, I'm, I'm going to feel like I'm being, being attacked. So I've got to either defend myself or I'm going to run away um, at least my literal interpretation of it. But uh, sometimes we can just feel uh, uneasy or uncomfortable. Um, you know, it might be an anxiety response, which is which is bringing that and not necessarily the environment. I mean, that's how panic disorder occurs, right? You you misinterpret that the, it's the environment that creates the, the experience, which obviously can trigger, um, but it's really your relationship with your internal experience that you're trying to avoid. Um, can, can you talk me a little bit about your research? How how uh, is this um, uh, research? Well, how do you look at these terms? How do we look at people's, um, uh, I suppose, perspectives, views, uh, how these things change over time? Um, I'm kind of just guessing as to how how we might do this. Maybe you could talk me talk me through a little bit about. I suppose this research has been going on for some time, so maybe you can talk me through early days and even you know more more recent times. Sure, look, I will. But just before I do, I just want to go back. I mean, I think it's a very insightful thing you just said about safety. Uh, and and again, I'm pretty sure you wouldn't have heard that kind of word being used about a weight room ten years ago, uh, unless someone was sitting under a a ceiling tile that was about to fall on them, because safety had this physical connotation and it's crept. Uh, to include psychological safety. And yes, of course, you have to take the feeling seriously, but you don't need to uh, agree with the client's uh, framing of it as a matter of danger. Uh, you might want to interrogate it, I'm sure, as a therapist. And look, I'm, uh, I was briefly a clinician, but no longer. Uh, but I think you don't need to um, um, agree with the framing. And I just do worry that uh, by identifying more and more things as unsafe, we're encouraging that fight or flight response uh, encouraging anxiety when it might not be warranted in many cases. But back to the research. Yeah, look, I've been doing this research with the help of Australian Research Council grants, which I'm extremely grateful for, uh, for I think about five years, five or six years. We, we do a range of things, Nesh. We, um, some of it I do work with some quite brilliant uh, computer scientists. And what we do is we look at how word meanings evolve in very large bodies of text. So, for instance, we've got a data set of about almost a million psychology article abstracts. So abstracts, for those who are not aware, it's a sort of one to 200 word summary of a research um, article. 
Uh, and uh, we've got abstracts going back for, as I say, almost a million articles um, back to the 1960s or so. Uh, and you can just uh, do clever analyses where you see whether the words, like the word trauma appears, whether it's got a narrower or broadern, broad, broader meaning um, as um, the word gets used across those um, th across the decades. So is trauma being used in a wider range of contexts now than it used to be in this corpus of about um, 130 uh, million words? I think it is, maybe it's million, I should, I should figure that out. But huge bodies of text, you run some very clever computational linguistic analysis of them and you see whether the word meaning has, has morphed in various ways. And uh, we find again and again and again that with a range of harm-related concepts, they tend to um, broaden their meaning in ways that can be detected not only within psychology text, but also in um, bodies of text that just come from general culture, magazine articles, fiction, newspapers, conversations, TV, program transcripts, things like that. So part of it is just looking historically, which is something most psychologists don't do. We don't really look at the past. We don't look at how things evolve over time. But uh, investigating um, using computational linguistic tools uh, the shifting meanings of ideas over decades. We also do some interesting work, I think, on individual differences in the um, expansiveness or breadth, we call it, of harm concepts. So we give people um, little uh, stories or descriptions of phenomena and they judge whether or not they constitute bullying or whether or not they're traumatic whether or not um, the person involved in some episode is racist. Uh, and using these, we develop reliable ways of assessing the extent to which people have broad versus narrow concepts of harm. And then we see uh, what are the implications or predictors or consequences of having broad versus narrow concepts of harm. And what we find is that people who have broader concepts of harm, that is who see a wider range of phenomena as harmful, whether that's bullying or trauma or prejudice or mental illness, they tend to be younger uh, on average, though that's not a strong effect. They tend to be more politically uh, left-leaning, progressive. They tend to be somewhat more empathic. They so tend to be slightly more neurotic. They tend to have a greater um, um, concern with social justice and a few other phenomena like that. So we look at individual differences uh, so that's not concept creep exactly, but it's this idea that people don't all have identical uh, understandings of what harm is. So we try to understand what are the roots psychologically of holding more expansive, um, inclusive concepts of what harm is. Uh, and in the sort of um, more recent work we've been doing, we've been, we've been focusing specifically on mental health related concepts. So we've been looking not just at the harm more generally, but specifically at diagnostic terms. Um, and at sort of mental health adjacent concepts like distress or stress or grief um, uh, or, or sadness, things which aren't clinical in themselves, but which might be undergoing concept creep as well, to try to see uh, whether over time they're, um, they're also broadening or also tending to be seen more as pathological phenomena. Um, and most recently, with a terrific uh, PhD student of mine, Jesse C., uh, looking at what predicts self-diagnosis. So we know that um, many people uh, believe, rightly or wrongly, that they have a mental disorder of some kind. We're trying to see what phenomena account for people's tendency to self-diagnose as having a mental disorder. Uh, is it just a matter of how severe their distress is, or is it also how broad their concept of distress, or their, sorry, how broad their concept of mental illness is? and various other phenomena. And although this work isn't yet published, we're sort of finding evidence that if you hold broader concepts of mental illness, you're more likely to see yourself as having one, holding constant how distressed you are. So that's a sort of really brief summary of about 20 or 30 articles we've written so far on this topic. Um, we think it's very exciting. We think we should continue to get funded um, and there's a lot more to be done. Just pulling, pulling together a few uh, uh, items there, which is concerning for 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 me. Obviously, these these broader concepts are correlated 
um, or people who hold these broader concepts uh, uh, are more likely to self-diagnose. Um, that's the correlation. Uh, I've certainly found in my practice is that it appears to me that there is more and more situation, or maybe not more, maybe it's always been that way, but certainly for, for me it feels that there is a tendency that when someone either believes they've got a diagnosis or it's reinforced that they've got a diagnosis as part of therapy, they tend to then hold that diagnosis for a long period of time. There isn't a tendency for psychology to question or, or, or uh, challenge when something is a diagnosis and when it's not, that that the, that people no longer meet the threshold of, of a diagnosis. So it ends up the, term, the terminology being, I've got X, which is I've got depression, I've got anxiety, uh, rather than, you know, I'm currently feeling flat, down, unmotivated, hopeless, um, et cetera. It's, uh, it's, all, it's like, I've got it. You know, it's something that, that um, is almost intrinsic. Uh, and, and that's obviously very concerning, especially with what you mentioned, that we're having a higher rate or at least a maybe a leaning towards more self-diagnoses as that particular population um, might be um, uh, experiencing it. Um, it's interesting to, to hear that the broader concepts are uh, more commonly from your research come you know, to be held by you know a little bit by younger people not not too highly correlated but but somewhat um, left leaning empathic a bit more neurotic um, and have concern for social justice and maybe that that's where that where the book is where that comes from in terms of how much of these uh, uh, how many I don't know, I'm not sure if I use them incidences or how many events or, or how many occurrences that have found themselves onto, onto media um, have occurred within universities? Yeah, look, I think some of the most uh, shocking examples have occurred on US college campuses where it just seems from an outside perspective and from a different generation, um, some of the episodes just seem a little bit absurd. Um, uh, the, the sort of, to me, sort of mislabeling of experiences and the excessively broad concept of what constitutes harm and not even just that, I mean, it's, you know, whether or not you define harm in a certain way, um, the problem is not just the, the the broad definition, it's the idea that it licenses you to to to, um, to attack the person who differs from you uh, in, in these concepts. So I think what Lukianoff and Haidt are objecting to is not just that there is this um, um, safetyism or that there is this excessively expansive idea about what is harmful, but that people believe that um, the right solution to that is a sort of, uh, I think what they call um, vindictive, I forget what they call it, there was some term they used where it, <clears throat> the, the idea that it licenses you to attack the person who, who, who um, who's offending your sensibilities. But look, I think, um, you know, th this is this is an ongoing thing. I think it's less uh, um, important perhaps in Australia because there's not, things haven't got quite so heated here on, on our campuses. Um, there's been, I think, also a bit of a, a backlash against it in the USA as well. But um, I think I've slightly lost the train of thought here. Nesh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, but... that's fine. I mean, the, the way I look at it, and these are obviously very extreme events that we see in the US campuses and, and, and as you say, as an outsider, because it's very hard to fully appreciate the, the ins and the outs and, and the like. But certainly just going from, from um, uh, the book, it almost, I mean, as a as a psychologist, but also as a fellow human being, I I feel a lot of compassion for these young people in in, in particular, in particular, because they are distressed. You 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 have a look, and someone who is screaming, you know, you have a, a young adult screaming at a mature adult um, in in a distressing way. Uh, you know, this is really kind of at least odd behaviour. For what we observe in Australia, that that you know, an adult screaming loudly and being distressed and crying, um, you know, shaking, uh, it, it's such such great intensity um, being displayed outwardly um, or even online. Uh, 
there, there, there's a compassion side that that from my perspective says you know we, we should really support the, 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 these people because they're obviously hurting at the same time in the same breath i suppose is is also the boundaries of of a capacity to go out and have these com these types of conversations about you know what is it that's actually harming you know to to, to try and come down from the screaming and and have a, a reasonable conversation so that we can understand each other and we can hopefully then meet each other's uh, needs if that's a possibility uh, or you know work out any uh, misinterpretations uh, because we still need to go out and, and live with each other in the community, in the workplace, at university, um, in our marriages, uh, and so on and so forth when difficult topics come up. You know, I, I know that's uh, uh, just, just it's triggered in my mind, but uh, uh, at the time when I was going to get married, my wife and I had to go to some um, marriage counseling. It was a requirement by, by the uh, uh, um, by the pastor that was was uh, or dean that was um, going to be our celebrant or whatever the correct language was, and I remember I was, I was fairly young. Um, I was like, "Oh, what's this all about? This is nonsense." I'll, I'll go through the motions, but in actual fact, they were really clever questions because they were geared around difficult questions like, you know, what type of schooling you're going to put your kids through. You know, how do you do your finances? Um, you know, how do you discipline kids? All of this sort of stuff that that I was, you know, just blowing off because I'm like, you know, I just want to get married. I don't want to go through this the, 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 these you know silly lessons. Um, but there's some some merit, there, 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 there's some value there, and and I think that's that place around the boundaries of having open dialogue and conversation, and and maybe setting up an environment of, about how you can do that as as young adults um, in a healthy way because there's a lot to traverse in, in a lifetime. And, and so this space around compassion for, for younger persons in particular, um, or, or, you know, those attributes that you mentioned, um, yeah, there, there, there's some real harm and distress and um, yeah, all harm is still harm, you know, whether, whether it's uh, uh, objective or subjective, um, I think we need to be compassionate and thoughtful. Um, I mean, that's what we do every day in, in the clinic is, is someone's, experiencing harm and hurt and how we go out and support them but that important notion of uh, uh, being able to validate someone's feelings but not necessarily follow their um, uh, uh, their thoughts and their reasoning because that might not actually be um, forged in in what other people could observe um, as, as being the truth, so to speak, or, or, or as occurring. Um, and it's almost like the Aussie way of the pub test. <laughs> you know, maybe it's a bit a bit, bit rough, but um, th th a bit of that concept coming in. Yeah, look, I think obviously you have to be compassionate with people who are suffering. Um, mind you, I think it becomes harder to have compassion when their response uh, is a violent one. Uh, when the response is yes. to cancel you or in some way foreclose any chance of dialogue. So I think you can be compassionate about the emotional response, but maybe less compassionate about the um, harsh um, behaviour that can follow from it. Um, so I think this is the challenge. The challenge is how to disagree well and productively, you know, despite differences, not to just uh, close people off, not just to uh, polarise people and see them as wicked and evil or stupid. Um, but just to say, here are some people with a very different understanding about um, uh, about the world than I. Part of those differences are based on concept creep, I would argue. You know, some people have adopted broader concepts of harm than others, um, you know, and just recognising that there are these massively different conceptualizations of words that we think have the same meaning because they're the same words, you know, like bullying and like prejudice and like mental illness. Um, that's, I think, that can take you about half the way to overcoming these issues, realizing that people see the world differently. Uh, and it's sort of second nature for you as a psychologist, but I think it's not always quite so straightforward for everyday people, especially in these more heated political type of arguments. Because I think the things that uh, Greg and Jonathan are saying in that book are primarily about these more politicized um, um, sort of social justice related issues on American college campuses. 
But I think maybe one could be a bit more optimistic in the therapeutic context, because I think getting back to what you said earlier, uh, yes, people do take a lot of comfort in their diagnosis and they often see um, the diagnosis as reflecting who they are, you know, forever in a way that might be counter therapeutic, that might get in the way of them uh, recovering. Uh, and there, it's not as politicized what is or what isn't a mental illness. Um, uh, there, you have a chance to, I think, you know, reason Socratically with the person about, you know, is this the best, most you know, adaptive way of thinking about the nature of your problems? Are you forever and always someone with this uh, condition? Or is it just describe the syndrome that you're experiencing uh, and maybe you won't always experience? Uh, I think, you know, the whole area of psychiatric diagnosis has become quite different in recent years. You know, back in the old days, people would complain that psychiatrists, these evil psychiatrists were imposing pathological concepts on innocent people and sort of forcing them into pigeonholes. Now people are jumping into those pigeonholes. People are seeking out diagnoses to give their experience meaning. And sometimes I think they're over eager. Sometimes people are taking on diagnostic identities, which maybe aren't always warranted and which may be very much um, getting in the way of um, good and effective treatment. It may actually be very counterproductive in the sense that they might actually be generating new um, um, mental illness that doesn't need to exist. There's a terrific British psychologist called Lucy Folks, who you might have come across, and she's written this uh, quite amazing paper recently uh, where she argues that a lot of um, the mental uh, health awareness campaigns that we are all aware of, which are trying to educate the public about the nature of mental ill health and, um, and broaden our mental health literacy, might actually be backfiring. So in some cases, sure, she would say they have a positive effect. They allow people to identify the nature of their problems, seek appropriate health, all good stuff. But also, she argues, in some cases, they can lead people to misidentify their own experiences, see themselves because they have occasional unhappiness as having depression or see themselves, you know, if they have a few repetitive behaviours as having OCD or if their mood's a little bit unstable, thinking they have bipolar disorder. Um, seeing those things as if they're mental disorders and once you see um, your own problems through the lens of a diagnosis, that can actually can be self-fulfilling, especially in the anxiety um, uh, domain. So if mm. you think that you have some sort of anxiety problem, you identify yourself as having um, social anxiety disorder, let's say, that can lead you to avoid things that might um, trouble you, might lead you to seek safety. And we know seeking safety in the anxiety disorders is counter-therapeutic. It's avoidance. And you can actually create and deepen and entrench uh, problems by um, um, misidentifying them as disorders. Uh, so I think Lucy's work, although it's not yet backed up by um, research evidence, although we're very much trying to to, to test it, uh, argues that some of these diagnostic identities can be not just mistakes, but really costly mistakes because they can bring about and deepen and entrench uh, mental health problems. How do you go about researching something like that, or at least you know testing that hypothesis? Well, I mean, I think it would be very, very challenging, and I don't want to give away any hints um, sure. to my intellectual competitors here. But, but look, obviously, you'd have to follow through. You'd have to follow people through time. You have to find: is there evidence that people who are exposed to mental health campaigns or who have broader concepts of uh, mental ill health is there any evidence that over time they're more likely to develop um, mental illnesses than those who don't have those broad concepts or who aren't exposed to? Um, uh, to, to these campaigns. So I think, look, it's it's a big, costly exercise. Uh, if you were to do it properly, you'd have to do a longitudinal study. You'd have to measure all sorts of things. You'd have to rule out all sorts of other uh, complicating, confounding factors. But it's not impossible to test in principle. But I think uh, the key thing at this point in the absence of that evidence is, is it plausible? And mm. I think Lucy's work and my work suggests it is plausible. Concepts of mental illness are broadening. That's just really indisputable at this point. Um, people are um, coming to consulting rooms like I'm sure your own, sometimes with misunderstandings about whether they actually have a clinically significant mental illness. Um, the sort of very welcome destigmatization of mental illness leads people to have one less reason not to take on 
a diagnosis-based identity. And that could very well um, be having lasting effects. Um, we don't know, but I think it is plausible. There's, there, there's even really strong forcing functions here in Australia, at least, that when someone goes to see their GP in order to get a mental health treatment plan, they require a diagnosis. And, and so the drop-down boxes to go out and complete a referral from a GP to a psychologist requires that they pick some of those boxes and, and they are diagnoses that, you know, it says either depression or anxiety, uh, which makes sense because it's a very functional, quick way to go out and refer from one professional to, to another. At the same time, uh, it, it would be very rare for a GP to say, I can see someone who's in emotional pain, but I'm not going to go out and refer you even though there is a, a a big current, you know, in today's age of saying, why wouldn't we go out and help and support uh, people and, and do an appropriate um, referral? But technically the referral requires there to be a, a, a mental health diagnosis. And so it has to go on there when potentially uh, you know, it could be argued that they don't actually meet the criteria but they're still being put down. And that's certainly not a judgment on GPs. I have all the the, the respect in the world with, with GPs and I work with them very closely and I think they're, they're, they're remarkable in what they do. But there's a forcing function there. And similarly, there's a forcing function for a psychologist to continue with you know treatment uh, in, in, in line with that diagnosis because in theory, we should be saying you don't meet the criteria, so I can't see you under the under the Medicare system. But there's this forcing function to just for all of us to um, play along with it, so to speak, you know, if that's the right word, or at least to to go in in, in line. And there's a there's potentially a very strong reinforcing function there that we're doing just by doing our regular job. Yeah, and I think I think you're 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 spot on with that. And look, I'm not engaged in mental health services, so this is outside my expertise uh, to some extent. But I think very often, you know, if you're a professional, you see someone suffering, you want them to get some sort of help. Yeah. And if you're going to, um, you know, not be completely stringent in how you apply the diagnostic rules, then so what? Um, but I think there is a downside to some of this. There is a downside to excessive diagnosis, both in terms of people's self-image and also over treatment. There's evidence that people who are on the sort of mild end of the spectrum aren't benefiting uh, nearly as much from treatment from those who are more severe. If the system gets full of people who are on the more sort of the less severe end of the spectrum, uh, that draws resources away from those who have um, sort of more intense impairments and distress. There's all sorts of arguments you can make that there is a downside. So in the case of each individual person, the person crying in your consulting room, of course you want to help them out in some way. And whether or not they meet the latest DSM criteria is sort of maybe in some respects irrelevant. Yeah. But at a systemic level, um, you know, I think I think there's a concern. There's there's a concern um, over prescription of antidepressants. There's all sorts of reasons why we should be a little bit um, uh, thoughtful about about how we do this. Um, and and I appreciate it's hard, and I appreciate that no one in this game is being cynical. You know, I'm not suggesting for a second that, as you say, GPs or psychologists are just willy nilly sort of throwing diagnoses around because they 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 don't care. I'm not suggesting that patients are seeking out diagnoses as in a sort of um, um, in a devious way, um, but I do think we're in a space where things that would previously not have been considered diagnosis and treatment worthy now are, uh, and um, that's not necessarily the best way to be. It's so interesting because, as I mentioned earlier in our conversation, talking about this, I, I want to push the envelope. I want to, you know question things and, and and do it from a, a curious space at the same time I still always feel nervous you know to to, to talk about these things yeah uh, you know these aren't necessarily um, positions that uh, are held hard and fast but they are important that they're discussed because without that discussion we can't go out and see that psychological range I mean it's a big part of psychological flexibility um, which you know is a, a a linchpin of the act model um you know it's, it's just going out and questioning trying to see forcing functions how do these things relate to each other what are correlations got to be obviously careful with with, with correlations they're not 
you know, causation. I'll take that from from uh, university forever because that was banged into our, you know, uh, wisely. Um, but how do you see these th- th- this space evolving with with uh, you know, terms like bullying or, or or racism, where you know, I, I think we saw in Australia very very recently the the yes no vote um caused a lot of uh you know pain amongst amongst many that that, that there was there it was very difficult for certainly in the media but i can't blame the media because they they're just selling eyeballs you know they they they're selling attention they're selling um anything that 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 that, that can be um sensationalized that that that's their job but how do we how do you see this space moving you know from australia uh you know bullying racism all you know some of those part of political conversations does concept creep do we see it creep back you, you know like obviously creep means that it's a slow movement uh, is there a likelihood of it creeping back towards some of these um more uh, 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 yeah, can it go in the other direction as well? I suppose is is the question. And do you see that as as being likely in some of these areas? Yeah, look, I don't really know. I haven't got a crystal ball that works, um, so I can't <laughs> tell for sure. Uh, but look, of course, yeah, concepts can move in in all directions. And and all we're saying in the Concept Creek work is that there's been a tendency over the last half century or so for harm concepts to creep only in one direction for our concepts to broaden and not um and not narrow so i think it's quite likely that some of these concepts will uh, will narrow back a little bit i mean there is a bit of a pushback i mean even this conversation this kind of conversation that's being had in many places is i think expressing some reservations people have about some of the conceptual changes uh and you sort of have to think that you know maybe these things will um will moderate a little bit over time but it's very hard to tell. It's also hard to tell how much further some of these concepts can go. You know, so, uh, you know, at some point you think, <clears throat> how much broader can bullying be um, than it currently is? <clears throat> and I think once you get to a situation where um, there are uh, lots of, um, lots of, you know, bogus complaints coming through uh, about bullying, let's say, that's when maybe the lawyers will decide to, 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 um, to, to narrow down the definitions again. But look, I, as I say, I, I don't really know where things are going. I just want there to be a conversation, you know. And I think also, uh, you know, again, I'm not a particularly political animal, but just understanding that the public define these different ideas very differently. What counts as racism to one person might very well not to another person. So whenever there's public debate that foregrounds that concept, um, be aware that no one thinks they're racist just about, but uh, there's huge diversity in people's understandings of what is racist. So it's just not a very helpful concept. And it probably is one that we over rely on sometimes in criticizing people we disagree with. So I just want a bit more yeah. thought about it. I definitely think in the mental health space, we're very um, ready for some hard thinking about this topic, you know, compassionate thinking, um, and not necessarily that we should contract um, our concepts, but we should at least be reflective about them. Look, and there's historical, you know, cases of concepts in the mental health field contracting. They don't always spread. So, for instance, you know, right back in 1972, um, the diagnostic system contracted because it decided that homosexuality wasn't a mental illness. Um, you know, so what had been previously considered to be a sign of psychopathology was was removed from that. So there's an instance where um, one kind of supposed mental illness uh, was um, thankfully removed from it so concepts can you know concepts like mental illness can contract they can broaden and i think um even around the dsm-5 when that came out uh, 10 years ago there was a lot of pushback against the 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 supposed broadening so alan francis who was the architect of dsm-4 was very very active in pushing back against dsm-5s um what he saw unreasonable expansion of the concept so you know there's a lot of forces you know, which are which I think are, are, are querying where things are going. I don't know where things where things are going, but I just think it's good that we're having this conversation. Um, and it's it would be good if we could have these conversations without people treading on eggshells, without without people querying one another's motives. Uh, the fact that you're querying 
what counts as trauma doesn't mean you think people are a bunch of crybabies. It doesn't mean you are unsympathetic to people who've experienced uh, horrible events or even not very horrible events, just just bad events. Um, so I think just mm. being cool, being reflective, um, trying to get some precision in our concepts um, would be really a good thing. I'd love to see, especially in, in, in psychology, more time spent, whether it's at a university level or, or just in, in, in uh, the field alone, of trying to get a better understanding or a consistent understanding among clinicians about what constitutes significant clinical impairment in, in you know, social, occupational, academic areas, because that that's pretty well, um, you know, one of the criteria in, in, in you know, m- most um, diagnoses that's provided. And it, it's very interesting because something like ADHD, um, which has this huge explosion of, of, of diagnoses occurring, I believe at the, at the moment, um, sometimes what's interesting is that people are functioning quite well um, and 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 have held you know quite quite um, significant roles. For example, um, they might still complain that they had a difficult time going through schooling and university and the like. But um, you know, it's almost a strength for them that they are uh, segmenting their attention rapidly and and therefore you know maybe being quite a successful business person. But um, they they can still often. Um, uh, not often that they, they can still potentially obtain this hypothetical um, uh, scenario, a clinical diagnosis, and hence I think this this idea of what is impairment. You know, how, how do we func- how do how do we have a consensus on that as a clinical group is is important um, because that just seems to be somewhat forgotten. You know, it, it, it it's a, it, it's one of the criteria that I don't think psychologists in general. And I'm I'm only speculating here but i don't think we think about that one with much weight or, or you know deliberate deliberate about it and, and 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 give it give it some um consideration i think you're spot on about that and that's exactly what i think as well um uh you, you know i think in professional training especially or undergraduate level even we talk about disorders in terms of their symptoms uh we don't refer to that equally important thing you know, significantly impairment, significant impairment in, in, in sort of life, love, work, whatever the, the phrasing is, uh, that's sort of ignored. And so people, I think, also self-diagnose based on, you know, yeah, sometimes I'm forgetful, sometimes I'm inattentive, sometimes I'm overactive, yeah, I get bored in meetings, uh, and they jump to a diagnostic conclusion, when, as you say, you would not make that diagnosis unless there was significant impairment. And I, it would distress me <laughs> if um, people going through uh, clinical training weren't learning about that, but it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, I mean, getting a calibrated sense of how severe impairment has to be in order to warrant a diagnosis takes some time. It takes some clinical experience. You know, when I was going through clinical training in the USA, what was really invaluable to me there, I think, was getting exposed to a very wide range of clinical settings. So I had a lot of time inpatient, a lot of time in very, um, in my during my intern year, very troubled people um, in, a, in a public mental health setting. And that really put the idea of what counts as impairment uh, into a different framework from when I was just doing therapy with middle uh, middle class people in a private clinic. Uh, And I think getting a judgment about what counts as being significant impairment is a challenge. And, you know, it's, it's, as you say, it's really important, but also it's still a bit vague. I mean, it's still vague, you know, compared to what, you know, how impaired does it have to be? Um, So there's always going to be some sort of fuzziness about these things. Um, and yet, if we don't pay attention to it, there is going to be, as you say, lots and lots of mistaken diagnoses going on. And I do think that's probably taken place to some extent in ADHD world. I suspect it might have taken place in, in the autism area as well. Uh, um, and uh, again, these are all very contentious fields, and I don't want to wade into them too much. But but I, I, do, I do get quite concerned about the ignorance or the neglect, I should say, rather than ignorance, the neglect of this impairment issue. Uh, I mean, the other thing I just say, just just for an, another angle on this, uh, is it's extraordinarily hard to know where to draw the line because there is no line. Mm. You know, the other side of my research, um, going back 
to the 1990s uh, is looking at whether mental health problems fall on a continuum or whether they're categorical. And of course, uh, we all know that uh, in most diagnostic systems, we treat mental illnesses or disorders as categories. You either have them or you don't have them. But the overwhelming conclusion from decades of research, which has looked at whether things are dimensional or categorical, is that they're pretty much all dimensional, meaning to say there is no objective line separating depression from non-depression or OCD from non-OCD or even psychosis from non-psychosis. Uh, everything is on a continuum. And when everything is on a continuum, it, there should be no surprise that people disagree about where diagnosis should start, You know where, where, where to draw the line. So it's extraordinarily difficult knowing where to draw the line and therefore no surprise when uh, lay people and professionals can have quite different understandings of what constitutes uh, mental illness. I think I need to to uh, put a bit of a shout out to one of my supervisors that I had when, when I was going through my uh, placements at uni, Paul White. He was... Uh, he was uh, leading the eating disorders unit in, in in Canberra at the time, and I remember as a young student sitting in a uh, in a round circle talking about clients, and I would say ninety eight percent of the clients who were referred after conversation with the entire team, and it was very methodical and slow. And there was even a psychiatrist that was on 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 the panel. Ninety eight percent of clients had you know an eating disorder not otherwise specified uh, and that was so amazing from a you know a young clinician perspective or a training clinician perspective to to see that people don't fit in these boxes or there is a box which which says it's it, it's not specified mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's a powerful concept or, or or understanding and learning that to go out and apply these categories in 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 this black and white way um, uh, uh, has benefit in some areas because uh, there's there, yeah there has benefits in some and then in others certainly from a clinical perspective and how we treat human beings um, I think we should take our time a little bit more um, and and I suppose go against the nature of concept creep because. I suppose there, there is a nature inside us that that makes it easy for us to to push language or not question language. You know, I find myself fairly literal. Um, that's probably my conscientiousness that 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 I have in um, as as a person. I gravitate towards that, and I'm you know lower on on um, neuroticism as as well. Um, uh, so you know, there are probably some traits that make it easier for me to stick to those but once again i can be rigid and that can be unhelpful in in that space as well but you know being able to observe oneself and and, and look at this about in a clinical impairment and um you know i think i think it's important and what you said as well if i can just quickly touch on that about the exposure for for clinicians um to see the breadth of you know whether it's the you know middle class, so to speak, in inverted co uh, commas, through to those who are very low on the socioeconomic status where, you know, working through child protection type of scenario, which was another one of my placements that I'm very grateful for. Um, you do see range and then you do ask yourself questions around impairment differently because you've you've observed it. Um, and, and I think there's, there's value in having that breadth in as part of our training um, and exposure. Um, similarly, that's what concept creep is in, in this sense, is, is exposure to the whole breadth so that you're not just sensitive to, um, you know, these 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 milder forms of, of suffering or, or, or discomfort. Yeah, look, I couldn't agree disagree with anything um, you just said. I mean, I think it's uh, having some flexibility is important and just uh, being a reflective practitioner and thinker, uh, um, yeah, you know, being being prepared to change your mind on issues. Um, and of course, when you're dealing with patients, clients, uh, or whatever you want to call them, you have to treat them as individuals, not just as representatives of categories. Mm. Uh, and and uh, no doubt that's important. But you know, I think look, I, I, I again, I, I'm a social psychologist these days. I'm not a clinical psychologist, um, and, and I, I, I very much value the work um, you folk do. And it's easy for me in my ivory tower to say all sorts of things, but it's actually 
um, you who um, has to sort of engage in the the, the 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 big messy world of practice. But I think it's so important for people in your world um, to be having these conversations and be thinking um, critically about what they're doing and to know the history of the discipline. And, and to reflect on it. And I think especially for recent graduates who maybe haven't been exposed to as wide a range of you know, clinical phenomena, um, practice settings, theoretical orientations, uh, it's really good just to keep your mind open and and, um, and, uh, and question, because I, I do think there's a certain amount of groupthink in contemporary psychology, and I do think it's good to have people, hopefully like me, who are a bit of an irritant sometimes and, and, and present things in a slightly different way. Nick, you certainly haven't been an irritant uh, to, to, today. I think you, you're very insightful and, and your contributions are, uh, are immense. Um, for those listeners who want, who would want to find out more, follow up on, on the concept um, uh, of, of concept creep, where can people find out more about you, your work um, and the like? I think if you just Google my name, it's not hard to find um, good places. So, I mean, I've got a university website uh, called Find an Expert. Um, I've got a ResearchGate page where you can get uh, access to a lot of my papers. If you're feeling like a uh, Christmas present, I've got a book called, um, golly, what is it called? Uh, Troubled Minds that came out this year about uh, mental health with um, Professor Sid Block, who's an esteemed uh, Victorian psychiatrist. Um, I write regularly for The Conversation. I write regularly for the magazine Inside Story. I try to review a lot of books uh, with a psychological flavour to them. Um, it's not hard. And if you want to find out more about Concept Creep, again, just um, go to my ResearchGate page. You can find the main paper. Uh, um, there's a You can read the book that, that you're talking about, Nesh, the, the, the Coddling of the American Mind. It's got a bit of coverage of it. Um, there's a lot out there. It's actually, you know, it's actually got a lot of attention as a concept, um, more so outside Australia than in Australia, to be to be frank. But um, and look, people should feel very comfortable just, you know, sending me an email if they want anything and want to chat about this stuff. Nick, uh, thank you so much for your generosity today. I um, feel very privileged, and and I want to thank you for your contributions as well. I think having open discussion and dialogue is, is such an important space or you know for for humanity and um I, I think you know when i reached out to you you were very generous and and, and made yourself available you know, instantly which i think you know says says so much uh, about you know your your willingness to have these conversations and and, and do it in not only a clinical way but one that is respectful to all people but important that we are clear and we actually have to sometimes irritate or push boundaries or question. And, and that doesn't mean that we're opposing um, uh, just because, but sometimes it does mean we're opposing because we hold a different view and having coexisting views is an important part of being human. So, you know, thank you for modeling that, um, you know, today and, and uh, yeah, appreciate your, your contributions once again. Thanks, Nish. I really, I really appreciated the uh, opportunity myself and thanks for a great conversation. If you enjoyed this podcast, please support it by going to iTunes and putting a review, subscribe, share it via social media and tell others about it. Start a conversation. It's listeners like you that make this able and possible and why we bring in these guests to go out and share their knowledge and resources. And just lastly, if you are a psychologist and you want to go out and be part of a bigger team, develop your experience and get into some exciting work, come to strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers and reach out. I'd love to hear from you.